about two more minutes. Just about two more minutes and then we'll kick it off. Thank you, Judy. Yes, I, I remember your name from other spaces we've shared before. Thank you so much. Carla, nice to see you. Julia, thanks for joining us. Nice to see you here tonight. Just about one more minute, then we'll kick off. All right. Well, good afternoon, friends, and welcome to our 2023 Idaho Legislative Wrap-Up. We're presenting today from the traditional lands of the Shoshone Bannock people. Uh, while attendees are joining, we invite everyone to check the chat and to take a moment to identify the Indigenous historical lands where you're joining from today. Uh, Jen Martinez is going to help us by putting links and a few cues in the chat as we go along tonight. Ellie? Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. First, I'd like to go through our agenda today. First, we're going to introduce our Idaho program staff from Legal Voice. We will then discuss the social, social justice lens Legal Voice uses to view its work during the legislative session. In doing so, we will focus on the composition of the Idaho State Legislature this year, including key minority leadership legislators. Next, we will share some highlights and lowlights of the 2023 session, which will demonstrate an overall tone of the 2023 Idaho legislative session. We'll go into greater detail on a handful of important bills that impact our primary mission at Legal Voice, justice and gender liberation. Finally, we will conclude this presentation by sharing a few ways that you might consider getting involved with the important work that Legal Voice is doing. Next slide. We have a lot of guests tonight from the legal field as well as uh, uh, medical professionals and other members of our community as well. So just a little bit of housekeeping for the attorneys in our audience. We're submitting this webinar for one CLE credit in both Washington and Idaho. So please check with your licensing authority in about three weeks for credit approval. If you're an attorney seeking credit, it helps us greatly if you will submit your name and your bar number to us after this webinar so that we can confirm your attendance with the bar. Next slide, please. With more than four decades of activism and advocacy, Legal Voice is a regional social justice organization with a focus in the Pacific Northwest. We have a home office in downtown Seattle and our work takes us to Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. Legal Voice has increased its full-time staff in Idaho to include our co-presenter tonight, Kelly O'Neill, who is Idaho Litigation Counsel. I serve Legal Voice as Policy Counsel and Legislative Lobbyist, and Wendy Hyped supervises advocacy work throughout our region as Senior Reproductive Rights Counsel. And behind the scenes tonight, the and deserving of some great appreciation from us for her efforts supporting us on this presentation is Jen Martinez. She is Senior Communications and Marketing Manager for Legal Voice. Next slide, please. People find themselves called to public service in different ways. And the way the patchwork of this social justice organizations in our area reflect this diversity, and we consider this to be a strength of progressive organizations like Legal Voice. We primarily approach our work with community lawyering. We are present among the people we serve and advocate for, 
We work to be visible, supportive, and public about the work that we do. And while we're not a law firm, we want our communities to be able to reach a lawyer in Idaho, in person, by phone, or by mail, and be able to answer particular questions about the state law in Idaho. We also want to be able to have an answer for what we are doing to change, improve, and support the law. Our work at Legal Voice is guided by our mission statement towards justice and gender liberation. This means we seek to liberate and achieve justice for all genders with a special focus on furthering principles of race equity. It is important for us to remind you that Legal Voice is a registered 501c3 nonprofit organization. We raise funds privately and receive no government grants. We do not take part in partisan politics and we do not campaign. Our work at Legal Voice is focused on policy, not politics. Next slide, please. As our webinar proceeds, we welcome you to use the Q&A function of uh, your Zoom uh, platform to submit questions or any other follow-ups that uh, may pique your interest or um, that uh, provoke uh, further inquiry while we discuss it. Um, feel free to use the Q&A function and we'll address those at the end of our presentation. I want to show you the composition of the Idaho Senate and the Idaho House of Representatives now. Beginning with the Senate, Republican members enjoy a very strong supermajority in an 80%, 20% split. We also see quite a lopsided representation by gender with members identifying as male at nearly 70%. Next slide, please. In the Idaho House, an even stronger Republican supermajority and an identical gender split. As this translates to policies or proposed legislation, it is nearly impossible for Democratic sponsors of legislation to achieve lawmaking goals. It did happen once this session, however, which we'll speak about in just a few minutes. But this dynamic makes it especially important for sponsors of progressive legislation in Idaho to populate the legislative record with context, content, and meaningful testimony so that future challenges to regressive lawmaking can stand upon a strong and supportive legislative record. Next slide. I want to reiterate at this point that Legal Voice is engaged in policy advocacy, not partisan politics. However, our priorities this legislative session have been coincided with the policy positions of two particular key legislators. Senator Melissa Wintrow and Representative Ilana Rubel. Throughout the session, our positions on legislation were most closely aligned with these two elected officials. You may have seen in news media and public comment, these two leaders were particularly vocal on the issues we care about most at Legal Voice. It's often said, I guess half joking, that in 2022, no one had seen a worse legislative session in Idaho until 2023. There's a trend toward rolling back social justice and civil rights advances, and the strength and will of the supermajority to do so makes it very hard to counter. To illustrate this, I wanted to discuss three bills that were particularly tragic examples of legislative lowlights this session. Idaho has now approved the use of a firing squad to carry out capital punishment in Idaho. This is remarkable for a couple of reasons. One, it is especially barbaric, especially in the experience of people who have served in the profession of arms or as law enforcement officers. Two, it requires an investment of close to a million dollars to construct a facility to carry out these executions. And three, there was a conspicuous absence of debate over the morality of capital punishment in the first place. The debate was never whether to maintain capital punishment, but how to do it. Also, at a time when other bills targeted 
representing the LGBTQ plus community were making their way through the legislature, there was a strong current that seemed to be heading toward a ban on public drag performances. In the name of protecting minors, this legislation would have created a host of First Amendment free expression problems, and it would have ignored the fact that so-called public decency laws are already on the books in Idaho. Fortunately, we were spared a full throttle legislative effort to ban drag performances this year, but I think we can expect to see this proposed legislation appear again early in the next session in January. And what I call a dishonorable mention, the Idaho legislature through calculated inaction allowed the Maternal Mortality Review Committee to sunset by not advancing a bill to renew it. Idaho ranks behind Kentucky and Mississippi in maternal mortality, and it ranks in the bottom 20% nationally. This is a legitimate public health crisis, and it was a shock to see such a simple and clearly necessary committee come to an end. Why was it not prioritized? Theories vary, but we cannot help but see misogyny, misplaced fiscal priorities, and simple counter-progressive ideologies at play at the expense of maternal health again. Next slide. And while there were some highlights, it's important to put these highlights into context. First, we have House Bill 314, which would have banned certain book titles from public libraries, including in schools and universities. This bill would have created a private right of action by an offended parent alleging their child's exposure to harmful material in a library and bring that action against a library or a library district or board. The material deemed harmful was clearly focused on themes of gender, sexuality, diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is a clear example of a conservative reactionary bill that would have targeted what is erroneously called the woke agenda. And although the bill passed both houses, the governor vetoed it in the last week of session. Additionally, the legislature missed an override by a single vote. While I think we can be thankful that this bill did not become a law, we must balance that with the realism that the bill narrowly failed an override, and we're very likely to see something like this emerge next session. Next, I'd like to call your attention to House Bill 104, which was given the short title, the Clean Slate Act. This bill was sponsored by House Minority Leader Representative Ilana Rubel, who we talked about in a previous slide. And this bill would allow people with low level criminal convictions to have their criminal records sealed and visible only to background checks that are necessary for certain work positions of public trust. It wouldn't be open to the average person to search. Since racial minorities tend to still be the subject of disproportionate prosecution, a bill like this demonstrates a good example of an outcome that begins to achieve the furtherance of our importance of race equity. Finally, commentators say the most dangerous bill to emerge this session was over the subject of the constitutional process to place a referendum or initiative on the ballot. One year ago, the Idaho Supreme Court struck down as unconstitutional a bill that would make the signature threshold for a ballot initiative much more difficult to achieve. The Supreme Court's reasoning was that because the citizen-led initi initiative process was considered a fundamental right under the state of Idaho constitution, and a statute could not overcome a constitutional provision. The legislative supermajority sponsors, therefore, wanted to amend the Constitution through a joint resolution. This would pave the way for a constitutional amendment ballot question in the fall. This bill failed in the House. Had it succeeded, and if voters had approved it, it would have made a ballot initiative so difficult that it would be practically impossible in the future. Next slide. Now I wanna focus on three new session laws that emerged from the session. These new laws are directly within our lens of justice liberation, and we'll get into a little bit more analysis through this presentation. 
First, House Bill 98, which was slightly changed and reintroduced as House Bill 242. It is a law that will take effect tomorrow, May 5th, 2023. This bill bans the travel of a pregnant minor out of state to procure an abortion in a state where it might be legal when that conduct is intended to be concealed from a parent or guardian. Simply put, it would criminalize an adult trying to help a person, pregnant person who is a minor, get abortion care that they need if that minor's parents did not agree to it. This bill was given a short title, which I'll repeat here, and then provide context as to why we don't regularly use that short title. House Bill 242 is officially called abortion trafficking. And this title mocks the terrible crime of human trafficking and places what we be to believe to be a fundamental right of fundamental, uh, excuse me, a fundamental right of bodily autonomy and reproductive rights into Idaho's criminal code. That is why we endeavor to recast this title as this law in terms that are more meaningful. It's a healthcare travel ban for minors. This bill includes the following key features. It creates a private right of action by family members against those who assist the minors travel. It establishes a floor of statutory damages of no less than $20,000. And it creates a four year statute of limitations on the civil claim which is nearly double what a typical civil claim is. Additionally, it confers upon the attorney general explicit original jurisdiction to prosecute. In a candid moment, the primary lobbyist achieving advancing this bill admitted that pairing the criminalization with a civil cause of action along with a severability provision is to increase the chances that if criminalization is stuck down, struck down, the civil claim survives. So even after a successful challenge and one that might not hold up in court, there's still some aspect of the law that remains as a deterrent based on a lawsuit of a minimum of $20,000. Subject of pending legislation is US District Court case that's Planned Parenthood versus Labrador, which is case number 123 CV 142 before Judge Windmill. There is no other law like this in the entire country, and we expect additional challenges, challenges in this bill next year. Next slide, please. The next especially harmful session law is House Bill 71. Its ugly short title is the Vulnerable Child Protection Act. This title is saturated with subtle intention. And we reject the premise of that short title. So we recast it as a healthcare ban for trans kids. We've seen identical model legislation appear in other states Kansas, Kentucky, Missouri, Montana, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, and Virginia. Gender affirming care for minors generally consists of a continuum of care or treatment. The protocol goes like this. First, experimenting with new or different styling, grooming, dress, comportment, coupled with specialized counseling and talk therapy. Further, a transgender child might be a good candidate for puberty blocking drugs, followed later by hormone therapy to encourage certain secondary characteristics and to discourage other characteristics. And much later, a transgender person might consider surgical interventions. And while certainly not a required process, this is often done after the age of legal majority. And right now, uh, at least to our knowledge, no surgeons in Idaho perform gender confirmation surgeries for minors with the exception of breast reduction or augmentation. The process of House Bill 71 as it reached final debate in the Senate was surprising, at least to me, because there was a remarkable amount of humanistic and sympathetic debate from legislators who many assumed would have supported the bill. One GOP senator in particular objected to this bill on the basis that it, quote, parachutes lawmakers into the exam room. 
As the bill picked up momentum toward the end of the session, the rumors abounded in the state house with stories of strong economic pressure upon the governor to veto and emotional in-person meetings with the governor's senior staff urging a veto. But with a handful of controversial bills at the end of the session, it was widely feared that the governor only had the political capital to exercise one more veto, and he used that veto on the library book ban, not on the health care ban for trans kids. This bill becomes law January the 1st, 2024. That's an atypical extension of time. Ostensibly, this extension was to allow kids already receiving gender affirming care to make alternative plans for care, to terminate care, reverse treatment protocols, or seek care out of state. In some cases we've heard of, families are making plans to simply relocate out of state. We do expect challenges to this law. Next slide, please. Finally, I'd like to summarize House Bill 374. This bill, which becomes law on July 1st, 2023, Codify some of the de definitions and language of Justice Brody's opinion in the Planned Parenthood decision from January 5th, 2023. The bill also drastically restricts the time limit within which a pregnant person must report an act of rape or incest to within the first 13 weeks after contraception. The bill is given the short title, the Defense of Life Act, but we are calling this a bill to amend portions of the criminal abortion statute. Next slide. Backstage helping us is Jen Martinez. And at this point, we'd like to consider some of your questions. I think a couple have come through. Uh, Jen, are you able to um, um, just ask those questions out loud or do you need to? Absolutely. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, for sure. So the first question that we have tonight is from Pam. And the question is, what, if anything, happens if the minor travels across the border unassisted by anyone to get an abortion without their parents' permission? Ellie? Well, I guess that would depend on if that minor was able to do it completely alone. But if the law is going to look further than that, of did someone give them a car to drive? Did someone give them gas money? Did someone set up the appointment for them? And if those people were adults that had some kind of help in the state of Idaho for them to create or act out that plan, they could fall within the provisions of, of that statute, um, which of course would create a chilling effect on any adult wanting to help a, a pregnant minor in a desperate situation. Thanks, Kelly. And I actually just received a question uh, on my phone through text. And the question says, why uh, I'm gonna I need to paraphrase, but the question is why did legislators not attempt to amend House Bill 71 to simply prohibit surgical intervention for um, uh, trans care for minors? The amendments to the the um, to House Bill 71 were not very vigorous. The first uh, introduction of the bill put the bill in um, a pretty um, a sensitive part of Idaho's criminal code, and that was um, the part of Idaho code that prohibits female genital mutilation. And the intent was to amend the title of that code to just call it uh, genital mutilation and to include um, the prohibition of trans uh, care for minors within that section of Idaho criminal code. And anybody who has, you know, any sensitivity and knowledge about what um, the, the experience or journey of a, a trans person looks like can see why that would be just horribly offensive to put um, that kind of care to categorize that categories that kind of care as criminal conduct just um, uh, really a, an ugly effort so the bill came back out of committee uh, with a um, new designation that was to create an altogether uh, new section of criminal code that was a small a small concession and cold comfort to people who are watching the evolution of the bill but there was no further effort at least not in in front of committee to amend that bill to re, to uh, um, bifurcate or split uh, the prohibited conduct. 
Um, a lot of folks ha spoke to me after this session and believed that there was a um, probably a good chance of seeing the the bill um, uh, amended in that way, but it just didn't. Um, and I had a few reflections about how the bill came out of the session and what it means for the LGBTQ plus community. And it's this, uh, the extension of time for uh, the effective date, normally we see bills um, take effect on or about uh, July the 1st. Uh, there are some um, variations to that theme, but normally it's July the 1st following the session. And this bill, as a reminder, takes effect on January the 1st of 2024. And as I mentioned earlier, what that does is, is uh, at least supposedly gives families time to make alternative arrangements for um, gender affirming care for their kids. Um, I don't think it does that. I think what it does is um, encourages families to move out of the state. And um, I, I hate to ascribe this horrible motive to the sponsors of the bill, but in this case, I firmly believe that the intent is to erase from our community trans people. Uh, there's really no other way to examine um, the effect of that law. So that's a, a long-winded answer, but I have some strong feelings of why this, this uh, law is especially pernicious, and, and those are some thoughts that I have. Jen, did we have um, any other questions we could look at? We do, yeah. So another question that we have in the Q&A is from Star, and the question, it says, doesn't the wording of House Bill 71's amendments also allow CPS or Child Protective Service um, social workers to seize transgender minors from parents under the accusation of neglect or abuse for allowing quote unquote vulnerable children to receive treatments. Thank you so much, Jen. For a second, I thought that I was I was muted there uh, for for a second. The bill um, the bill certainly does criminalize um, uh, care for trans minors for trans kids um, and. As you know, in Idaho, the fun or the uh, the apparatus of child protective services um, can intervene uh, through um, through the integration of um, of child protect of the Child Protection Act as well as um, the new statute itself. So the answer to your question is yes. Jen, anything else? There's nothing else in the Q&A, but we did have a couple of questions that came in beforehand that, that might be helpful right now. Um, so one of the questions was um, like, what are curious about next steps? I apologize as well if you hear my son in the background, it's bedtime and he's getting a little fussy. Um, but what are the next steps specifically around House Bill 71 and the anti-abortion bills? The it, that's a, a delicate question, and here's the question that I think really uh, commands the answer, which is what are what's our response to this going to be? Uh, we were trying to set the stage in this webinar that we have a very difficult legislature um, that seems to be um, working hard to roll back advances in these important social justice areas. Um, so we 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 sort of knew it wasn't going to be a positive outcome, at least from the legislative session, and we had to really think about how we were going to respond. When we see laws come through uh, the legislature like this, and there's no way to stop them, and we and we are unable to leverage um, sort of that that uh, social pressure upon the governor to use his veto pen, we have to consider other alternatives. And for a lot of uh, social justice nonprofits like Legal Voice, we have to look at litigation as an option. And uh, there are a number of, of very um, successful, very effective social justice organizations working in Idaho. We count ourselves among them. And we are looking at um, the, the House Bill 71, 242, as well as 374 for potential challenges. Um, that's that's our obligation to the communities we serve is to provide a sense of of hope that that we are on the front lines in those fights and that we're going to use all the tools at our disposal to try to um, restore the rights that that we're entitled to. 
And Thank Jen, you. I think you said you had one more, isn't that right? Yeah, there's another question that just popped up in the Q&A. So I'll, um, the question for both you and Bill and Kelly is, does House Bill 71 allow legal issues for parents if they live on border states and access gender affirming care across the border? What if the teen does it alone when they can drive to Washington on their Yep. So this this one has a pretty um, interesting interplay, and and we've actually been paying attention to this as well. So House Bill 242 is the bill that criminalizes the transportation of a pregnant minor across state lines for the purposes of abortion care. House Bill 71, which uh, criminalizes the provision of gender affirming care for minors, um, does not have the same um, aspect to it. It does not criminalize uh, transportation of um, a, a trans kid across state lines. But we watched for that and we were worried it would go that way. And 2024 is a new year. So what seems to us to be a social purge underway uh, to try to make Idaho so uncomfortable um, for um, the beautiful diversity that most Americans value, um, I, I would not be surprised to see more pressure put on uh, on Idahoans, just like what was described in that question, Jen, that we might see more pressure um, that would uh, not just criminalize um, uh, gender affirming care for minors, but it might attempt to mimic the uh, the House Bill 242 provision that criminalizes the transportation of a pregnant minor. And I think we can expect to see a bill in 2024 that uh, would attempt to prohibit gender affirming care even for adults in Idaho. Thanks, Bill. Uh, there's no more questions in the Q&A, but one of the questions we got beforehand, which um, you mentioned there were some attorneys on here, so this might be helpful for folks, is, is there a way for lawyers to help with litigation tasks other than donating money? I think the answer might be no, that is unwieldy to manage. However, I want to ask anyway. So is there is there any other way that attorneys can get involved? Thanks so much, Jen. There are a couple ways, actually some really great ways. Um, there is... Um, uh, a uh, wide open arms. We we welcome uh, participation of lawyers in kind of a thoughtful roundtable that meets every week to discuss um, the impact of the Dobbs decision on reproductive justice, as well as gender justice um, more generally. We also are are more than willing to accommodate um, volunteers and other aspects of the work we do. So the best way probably is uh, just to reach out to us so that we can find a good fit uh, for the volunteer work that you think you might be able to contribute because um, the work we do um, all across Legal Voice, whether um, communications and marketing or, um, or uh, development, which is important for the work we do or for the, the lawyers on staff who uh, develop policy or who litigate, um, we we need those those powerful brains. We need fresh thought. We need innovative solutions to some of these problems, which are are difficult to overcome. Thanks, Bill. And we did get one more question, which uh, this will be our last question for the evening. Um, but the question is: Is there a way for parents of trans teens to take the state to court to dispute House Bill seventy one before it becomes enacted in January? If my 12-year-old can access birth control and pregnancy care without my knowledge or consent, my 16-year-old should be allowed to take testosterone. I really appreciate the question. The answer is yes. Please send me an email at wmitchell at legalvoice.org. I have information for you. Thanks, Jen. Anything else? Those are all the questions we have so far. Well, that'll conclude uh, uh, and wrap up our 2023 legislative wrap up. Um, we featured just legislation that impacts gender justice and liberation just to um, help folks see that this uh, legislative session was not just about uh, property taxes and um, funding of education. Um, it was not a good session 
for gender justice. It was not a good session for LGBTQ people. It was not a good session for pregnant people. And next year will be worse. You can get involved. Many nonprofits in Idaho are working hard throughout the year to help inform and educate our neighbors and to influence the direction of our policymakers toward more just and equitable outcomes. We're one of those organizations, and, and we want to share a few links to our own communications initiatives, including our email news and updates, our social media presence, and a link to even consider financial contributions to our mission. We also welcome those volunteers. So at the conclusion of each legislative session, we don't go into hibernation. This is the season when we focus on traveling around the state throughout the spring, summer, and fall in order to join community events, gatherings, pride festivals, house parties, neighborhood updates and rallies that we call Pints and Progress, and other outreach too. So if you join our email alerts, you'll receive notices of all of those events as they get scheduled. Again, for those of you attending who are seeking CLE credits, please email us your name and bar number so we can confirm your attendance. But we really thank you for your attention today. Uh, please feel free to email us with any questions or comments, and we'll respond as promptly as we can. This will conclude our webinar. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.